This is KPRN DB, broadcasting worldwide from Southeast Oklahoma, USA, to parts unknown. The new Be Prepared for Christmas package from Sun Oven contains everything you need to harness the power of the sun for cooking, water, and dehydrating. The perfect gift for the preppers or outdoor enthusiasts on your shopping list. A Sun Oven uses the sun's power to bake, boil, or steam food, heat water for purification or personal hygiene, or solar dehydrate. When you use the sun's power on sunny days, you preserve your fuel storage for rainy days. Sun-baked foods retain moisture, have less shrinkage, and do not burn. Sun-baked roasts are tastier and more succulent, and sun-baked bread has unparalleled taste and texture. The new Be Prepared for Christmas package lets you roast an 18-pound turkey. For the past 26 years, Sun Ovens has been proudly made in the U.S., are durable, and have a long life and come with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Don't be fooled by cheap imitations. For a discount coupon, visit sunoven.com forward slash podcast. That's sunoven.com forward slash podcast. Have you ever wanted to generate your own supply of electrical power, even save money on your electric bill? If so, this is going to be the most important message you will ever hear. Solar power generators are now available. These emergency backup systems provide life-saving electrical power when you need it most. Unlike gas generators, a solar generator runs quietly, emits no fumes, and produces electricity from the sun. It's like having an electric power plant running quietly in your own home. Run sump pumps, shortwave radios, computers, and even keep your food from spoiling. Whether it's hurricanes, ice storms, brownouts, or blackouts, you'll never suffer through painful power outages again. And here's the best news. A remarkable fall truckload sale going on right now gets you $1,700 in bonuses when you buy a solar generator. To find out why solar generators are the best generators and get $1,700 for doing so, go to falltruckloadsale.com. That's falltruckloadsale.com. Generate your own supply of electricity. Go to falltruckloadsale.com. That's falltruckloadsale.com. Feeling like there are too many pressures and demands on you? Losing sleep, worrying about tests and schoolwork, eating on the run because your schedule is just too busy? You may be under too much stress, and it may be affecting your mind. Keep your mental edge back with New Tropic Mind Power from MindRegard.com. New Tropic Mind Power is not a drug, but a natural supplement. Its 12 powerful ingredients are natural and non-GMO, plus it's gluten-free, wheat-free, and formulated by Americans for Americans by an NSF-certified laboratory. Nootropic Mind Power is available at mindregard.com, spelled M-I-N-D-R-E-G-A-R-D.com, and comes with a 100% money-back guarantee. Free your mind with Nootropic Mind Power Cognitive Supplement from mindregard.com. Mind regard. Clearly see tomorrow and yesterday. Today. For starters, uh, this is not uh, Barack Obama. The uh, Podcast Radio Network has started a drawing for a, uh, a high point uh, 45 caliber handgun. Provided to them by uh, MKF Supply. Now, I have the power to take that gun away from you because uh, the United Nations has given me that power. I don't need Congress, and I, I don't need the Constitution. All I need is a reason to take away your weapons. So, if you're feeling lucky, go to PrepperPodcast.com. Uh, That's uh, P-R-E-P-E-R-P-O-D-C-A-S-T, uh, PrepperPodcast.com, to see the rules, uh, terms and conditions, and to enter the drawing. Uh, when I take away your guns... Uh, your Bible's going to be next. Uh, again, uh, this is not uh, Barack Obama. The truth is out there. Knowledge is power. This is the Prepper Podcast Radio Network. <laughs> you from the foothills of the Sheep Mountain Range under the watchful eye of Mount Charleston, 11,916 feet above the desert floor, I bring you Homestead Dividends, a podcast rooted in common sense and practical knowledge, where home improvement homesteading and self-reliance meet. 
where we focus on family, home, and country, where we say stop working for your home, put your home to work for you, where we promise you four things, I'll save you money, I'll save you time, I'll give you perspective, and I'll give you the support that you need to do it yourself. I am your host, Dan B., a regular guy with a family of faith and a bunch of friends, you guys out there. Today's episode is the pre-Christmas episode. This is roughly the 21st of December, 2012, and this is actually recorded a little bit before then. Um, before we get started with the show, just a little bit of housekeeping. My website is hdivs.com, again, hdivs.com. If you like what you hear, please go over to my website, click on the subscribe via iTunes button, it'll take you to my page on iTunes, click subscribe for free, and all of my podcasts will now be coming your way. You can also go to the RSS, or really simple syndication little button, that's the three little white lines and the orange little box of little squiggly lines. If you click on that, not only my podcast, but anything that I add to my site will be updated and mailed or sent to you. And uh, that's another great way of keeping track of things. Listen, once you're in iTunes uh, and you've clicked subscribe, would you do me a favor? If you haven't already done so, can you put in a good word for me if you like what you hear? I do the show as a... Uh, as a labor of love, I do it at absolutely no cost. Consider a good word on iTunes or your social media of choice in passing on the word uh, payment in full. As I like to say, tune in, tell a friend, and subscribe. So whether it's Twitter, my handle is HDIVS. On Facebook, again, you can find me under HDIVS or Homestead and Dividends. Uh, submit my articles on Reddit, uh, Doug and uh, any of the others stumble upon, and uh, get the word out on the, on the show and the programming and the episodes that you really like. Also, remember to click the contact button and let me know how I'm doing, and I uh, give you suggestions. Visit the forum, which is up and running after I nuke the hideous uh, little group of spammers there, and uh, there's plenty of space for you guys to put what you want. So uh, with that, let's get started with today's show. First, um, one last thing. I uh, am back on the mend here. Those of you that know, had I had a nice little surgery there, and uh, I just got my checkup from my doc the other day, and uh, the patch that he, patches that he put in, I had uh, two areas, not technically, I guess it's not called a double hernia, but I had a weakness in my wall in two areas, and he patched them up, and I just got a clean bill of health yesterday, and he said they can start exercising. So last night I ran one mile, tonight I ran three miles. Um, I am so happy. And for those of you who are creatures of habit, and for those of us probably a little bit on the anal retentive spectrum side, you know, if you get off your routine of running, or whatever your routine is, um, especially people exercise and creatures of habit, it's brutal. Um, it was like, I don't know how to explain it, but like getting a thousand doses of antidepressant drugs today, going out and running for three miles in the st- under the stars at night, even though it was freezing out. Um, I can't even begin to express the euphoria and just joy that I had being able to exercise again. And along with that, I just wanted to send along my thanks to those of you who had kept me in their thoughts and prayers and uh, were thinking about me, and I do appreciate the support. Um, I really do. Today's show is a very, very sad and horrible show, and uh, it's a good show in in some ways, too. Uh, The title of the show is I Bet You Didn't Know, and I'm going to be doing some straight talk, frank and earnest, about um, guns, gun control, and some other things that seems to be in the news lately. And if you follow my podcast for a long time, you would know that my podcasts tend to be very happy, and I tend to laugh a lot in them. If you've listened to the last couple... Um, because of some of the things in the news, I haven't been my cheery old self on some of these podcasts. And uh, I promise that as best I can, I will uh, put a you know, good foot forward going forward and give you those positive, inspirational ones um, that uh, you need and deserve. But I certainly can't, in light of what happened, put on a fake front. And I don't think you want a cheery person today in light of what happened in Connecticut. And for those of you listening in a future date, there was a mass murder in an elementary school in Connecticut uh, about a week ago. And it is absolutely horrifying. Uh, Approximately 20 children and multiple adults were murdered by a sick and deranged gunman. And um, it is just absolutely heartbreaking. And, uh, you know, when, when this happened... Um, I was teaching, and I learned about it. And my students came back from lunch, and um, 
they saw visibly that I was upset and that something was wrong. And they asked me what's wrong, and most of them didn't know. And I started to explain what happened, and I have to admit that I started to cry in front of my class. Uh, my eighth graders, which this is an accelerated or talented class, um, handled it well. And uh, they could see that I was visibly upset. Is that good or bad? I don't know. Should your teacher and your leader show emotion? Uh, true emotion, sincere emotion? I don't know. Um, they got to see a male or a man cry and be overcome with emotion and sadness. And maybe that's good. Maybe they needed to see someone strong. Maybe in tears there's strength. But in any case, they saw me cry as I thought about all those little children. And as a parent, as a father, and just how devastating. And let's not kid ourselves. Those parents or those people who survived the loss of their family and loved ones, they're going to be severely damaged the rest of their lives. You don't overcome something like that. You can cope with it. Having been living in a family with a with a, a family that, you know, we buried my brother when he was seventeen. Um, I can tell you that parents don't don't overcome that. They deal with it but they never forget. And it's devastating. Uh luckily my family instead of tearing apart all together and their faith and their love for each other all became stronger as we got through this together. Um, it tears other families apart. It devastates people. And it starts a chain reaction of other sad and horrible things that are absolutely, absolutely devastating. My heart, my prayers go out to these people. I am so very sorry for what you suffered today. And I am not going to be so condescending to say, I understand or I feel your pain. I have never had someone murdered. I have no idea what you're going through. I have no idea the senselessness and the confusion and the desperation and the hopelessness a parent can feel sending off the kindergarten or first grader um, off to school and them not returning home, a place that's supposed to be safe. And I promise to my kids as best that I can to keep them safe at school if it means I need to get in front of a gun. Um, and take a bullet. And that is something I don't joke about. And it is very real. Schools have changed. Society has changed. And people have changed. And this is a very, very sad day. And in light of that, I understand the hatred and the anger people have towards guns. I absolutely do. So if you've come here today for a rally cry um, for the Second Amendment, You'll hear it in a minute, but just understand, on an emotional level, I completely understand people un, um, being angry with hating guns. Because you know what, and this is another one of those I bet you didn't know. I bet you didn't know that I really, deep down inside, on some level, hate guns and what they can do. Now, there's a part of guns that, you know, fascinate me. As a boy, I had to be a gun, and I was, for the most part, responsible with it. Um... When I was older, I shot a couple guns a few times, and I now have guns, and I take that oath of responsibility of, of owning a firearm very, very, very seriously. Um, I was not raised in a hunting family. My parents, and my father especially, always was afraid of guns and passed that fear on to me, so maybe almost an unhealthy fear, nevertheless a fear of guns and an absolute respect for the power of guns. And as you know, Clint Eastwood once said in the movie Unforgiven, which was just a tremendous movie because it took the glory away and, and away from Westerns. And it was a really dark Western, but it was a really good one. And there was a boy who was bragging about killing people who hadn't really killed anyone. He was a boy. Then when faced with the absolute terror and horror of having to kill someone, which he did, he broke down and just lost it. And Clint Eastwood... Maybe in so many words, but the essence of what he said was, killing a man is, you know, it's a big deal. He said, you take everything he's had, he has and everything he's going to have. And to take away everything, to take away a life, and those children so full of life, to take away everything they have, and that beautiful potential of a child and everything they're going to have, is absolutely horrible and just devastating. And that's where my heart is today. I'm sickened by what happened. And there's a part of me that said, you know what, right after this, with my emotions, ban every gun, to hell with this, 
we can't handle these freedoms. Maybe we should trust our government. We have horrible monsters in our society that are going to get guns, and maybe it's best if we just eliminate all guns. Then I remembered a few things. The guns are already out there, and the criminals are going to have access to them. If we ban them, the law-abiding citizens won't. I remember, too, stories. And having a family with Eastern European background, um, I know the Europe that was murdered and butchered. Having family from Hungary and Czechoslovakia and the Slovak Republic, Yugoslavia, um, and countries like that, Transylvania, uh, my family knows about the horrors of these repressive governments that have marched through, killed and murdered, and destroyed, and a population really unarmed. Uh, not too far to the west, or to the east, excuse me, Poland. Um, people want me with pitchforks trying to fight off the onslaught of the Nazis as they march through and butchering them in the streets. You know, this is a really ugly issue, guys. And if you're looking for just some absolutely black and white, easy, cold, and calculated argument today, you're looking at the wrong place. Um, this is an ugly, ugly story. And it brings up ugly feelings about guns and my love-hate relationship with guns. And that's why I entitled this episode, I Bet You Didn't Know. Because if you want someone who is absolutely unwavering in support of the Second Amendment, I am. I'm just talking on an emotional level, the part of me that had to wrestle through this stuff. I'm just laying it out here. I could easily hear all this stuff from you and just said, I am Mr. Second Amendment, right, wrong, or indifferent, and I never waver. I've got to tell you, seeing murder and murder with a gun is devastating. But you know what? Murders happen with or without guns. And you know what? Taking guns away from me isn't going to take guns away, period. It's just going to take a gun away from me. And I can tell you this. Being a person with the awesome responsibility of owning a gun, I know I'm going to use mine correctly. It will only be in the most horrible of circumstances that I'm going to carry a gun and use it against another person. I take that responsibility solemn. Solemnly, I take that. And that is no joke. I'm going to talk a little bit about the defense of the Second Amendment, and I have an enormous respect for the Second Amendment. And I'm going to go through some of my different cases. But I put it through a dialogue, and a little dialogue I have with you today is just going to be, I bet you didn't know. So let's get started with it. First, what would your reaction be to a life insurance salesman that used this tragedy to sell some insurance and make some money? That would be pretty disgusting, wouldn't it? Think about the people, the politicians, who are using their outrage and sadness in this horrible disaster to score political points and further their own agenda. Are they any better than an insurance salesman using this tragedy to sell insurance and put money in their pockets? Do you really think these politicians that want to take our guns away are doing it to make us safer? Or do you think it's to promote some agenda that maybe only tangentially or only slightly is about the common good. Just remember a couple of things, folks. We must always defend our republic. That's what we pledge our allegiance to. Not to our president, not to our congress, not to our senator, not even to our leaders in general. I pledge allegiance to the flag and what it represents, the United States of America of the United States of America, and to the republic, not a democracy, a republic, and the laws that protect the rights of the minorities and the majority. For which it stands, one nation, under God, they allow us to use that word for now, indivisible, cannot be broken, with liberty and justice for all. Think about that. Liberty, freedom, Justice, fairness to everyone. Things to think about today. Is it fair to take guns away from all and deny us our Second Amendment rights for the weaknesses and the evil of, of the few? 
something to think about. I have a website here that I want you guys to think about also. And it's called An Accounting of the 20th Century Atrocities. At least that's the link. And right above it, it says, this site will give you perspective on how it can happen anywhere. And I'm not talking here about mass murder in terms of a suicidal sick range person. But I'm talking about a greater evil. And that is, in a society without guns, what is to stop a government from becoming oppressive? Or if you have a great country and a great republic like ours, what if something were to happen and our country is overthrown? We give our trust in our government that's so wonderful to uh, protect us, so we give them our guns. But then our government goes away. Countries are taken over. We think we're invincible. So did the British at the beginning of the 20th century. The British Empire started the 20th century, the great power of the world. The sun never set on the British Empire. It, the British Empire was all over the world, on every continent, probably even an outpost on Antarctica. They are not a superpower anymore, and they have their own issues. We are the superpower now. China is becoming the superpower. Who is to say that things will not change? In fact, the only thing I am sure of is that things will change. And I cannot plan for the future precisely because I don't know. Neither could the Founding Fathers. Neither could many people, but you know what they did know? Change and danger are inevitable. And we as a people need to protect ourselves. So I give you a list of some of the great mass murderers in governments that are murderers of the 20th century. And I also link to a couple specific things about countries, civilized countries, without great access to guns, liberal European countries, that uh, other countries that were educated and, and well-versed in, in you know, statecraft. This couldn't possibly happen. Yet Germany invaded France. Yet Germany invaded Yugoslavia. Germany invaded Poland. The Soviets invaded Poland. The Soviets invaded Hungary. Mao Zedong in China murdered over 40 million of his own people. Stalin, I believe, was the murder of 20 to 50 million of his own people. There are many reasons why we need to protect ourselves, either from um, enemies foreign or domestic. And let's think about that. Remember that when our president and our le elected officials are sworn in, they promise to defend our country against enemies foreign and domestic. And as you look at the list of atrocities, you can see that some of these murderers were foreign and some were domestic within their own countries. And that's why the right to bear arms is so important. And it is an awful, ugly, awesome responsibility to own a firearm something not to be taken lightly, and if you can't take it seriously, don't own one. I hope, and I know, that most of my listeners can and will own firearms responsibly if they choose to. Let me just read a little bit here, because I'm getting a little emotional. I've been, it appears, rapidly defending the Second Amendment at a very insensitive time, and if you've seen my tweets or been on my website, I've actually been very vocal in my support of the Second Amendment, despite my heart and my feelings. And I'm just being honest with you guys that even though I know it's right, sometimes right isn't easy. And my heart wants to say, yeah, let's, this is too much. Let's take these guns away. But let me continue on and let's work through this together. Or you help me work through my ideas and my feelings about this. How can I, at a time like this, be thinking about the Second Amendment? My answer is this. It's easy to defend something when times are easy. The Second Amendment is under attack, and it's time to stand up and be counted. You think it's fun defending gun rights after that slaughter in Connecticut? You think I like doing this? You think my heart doesn't go out to those kids and their families? But before you con count me among the rabid gun lovers in this country, I have a co confession to make. I bet you didn't know. And here I just backtrack slightly. And I mention here on my website, as I'm reading, um, my love of BB guns, or my enjoyment of them, 
but I've always been afraid of guns. Yet, even though I'm afraid of guns, I defend our Second Amendment ferociously because I know it's right, even if it's uncomfortable. And believe me, folks, today, in this climate, with those little children so fresh in my mind, it is absolutely and utterly uncomfortable defending the Second Amendment. I bet you didn't know. The real reason I know we need to defend gun rights is because I believe the Founding Fathers, and I believe that they're smarter than I am. A little quote I have here, and it's actually a long quote, but it goes on and talks about tyranny. And um, it's from Thomas Jefferson, and I'll read part of it. It says, under governments of force, and he mentions three different kinds of governments. Um, one without governments, and he says among Indians, is in people who are more primitive. Governments wherein everyone has just influence, kind of thinking about ours. Okay? And then tyranny. Under governments of force, as in the case of all other monarchies and in most of the other republics, to have an idea of the curse of existence under these last, they must be seen. It is a government of wolves over sheep. It is a problem. Not clear in my mind that the first condition is not the best. But I believe it to be in inconsistent with any great degree of population, meaning in kind of the anarchy state of primitive organization of culture, probably can't be done. And he goes down and talks about some things. There are some other parts to it, I think, that are very, very, very important. Okay? I hold that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing and is necessary in the political world as storms in the physical. This is what Jefferson says. That's that quote, you know, a little bit of revolution, rebellion, whatever is a good thing. And this is the actual quote. As necessary in the political world as storms in the physical our founding father didn't say this. Jefferson didn't say this because it was easy. Okay, we're just starting out a new country, and he's saying there are many times when oppressions are so great that we have to break away, or our government is usurped or taken over by another government, and that government becomes evil, and we need to protect ourselves. I fear what any government could become when it stops fearing its people. And how does it fear its people? Uh, when it can, when the people can defend themselves. When it stops fearing its people, the government becomes a tyranny. I refuse, I go on here, to let that happen, even though it means I need to take the ugliness that accompanies personal freedoms and the abuse guns cause in the hands of criminals and idiots. Yes, there are monsters. Yes, there's, there are irresponsible people. But in balance, protecting ourselves against the tyranny of governments, foreign and domestic, is greater. When I talk about 20 to 50 million Russians, 40 million Chinese murdered by their own governments, when I talk about the Nazi war machine killing 6 million Jews, World War II and the millions and tens of millions, upwards of 100 million people and the two world wars, well over 100 million people killed senselessly, whether it be soldiers, civilians, you know, collateral damage, whatever, over 100 million people in a period of, you know, less than 30 years. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? I feel horrible. And I, just, I need to balance that with the actions of a few, very few, depraved, sick people. Why? But let me go on. Why do I support the use of assault rifles? I bet you didn't know. The Founding Fathers did not protect gun rights simply for hunters. It was for citizens to defend themselves against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Our elected officials were smart. Okay? Our Founding Fathers, they realized that they can't provide for everything, and a people need to defend themselves. Okay? So why are we crazy for preparing to prepare for a conflict our Founding Fathers envisioned? and every elected official swears an oath to. Think about this. Our, our elected officials swear an oath against to protect the country, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Our elected officials swear that. But at the same time, people who paint preppers, and people who protect their country's freedoms with the right to bear arms in the Second Amendment, as crazy for wanting to protect ourselves 
<laughs> under the same philosophy and the same guise as our founding fathers and our elected officials. I want to be sworn and domestic. Why are we crazy when we prepare uh, for a conflict our founding fathers envisioned? Why? Our elected officials swear to do the same thing. The point is, it's not crazy to want to protect our country. And remember this line, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to bear arms shall not be infringed. This is going back to the gun thing, and I didn't finish it. Assault rifles. Why? Because they were not used or envisioned to help hunters get a deer. It is to raise your level of firepower to that of the oppressors. Okay? Let me put it to you this way. If our government fell, do you think the new government, a foreign government, or an evil government from within our own country, if it's evil, will send soldiers armed with flintlock muskets from the American Revolution? No. They're going to come after our citizens, because I assume there would be some kind of a conflict, with fully automatic assault rifles. And citizens, the flintlock, flintlock rifles, not going to work. Deer rifles, not going to work. Citizens with semi-automatic rifles, because remember, we're not allowed to own full automatic rifles, will at least stand a chance of defending themselves. You're still outgunned in semi-automatic versus an automatic. Do you know how sickening it is for me, though, to even write these words and consider a war on our own land? To consider the fall of our government? and how much I love our country and our republic, or an invading force, or God forbid terrorism here. Yet our founding fathers had the stomach to do it, and to fight wars. Our founding fathers, and there are more wars than this, but they fought two wars on our soil. The Revolutionary War, when remember that they were traitors when they uh, performed these acts. They were subjects of England. So while we look at them as heroes, they were traitors in England, which is the country which it was at the time. So we honor traitors. They broke away from their own country. I see them as heroes and patriots, but not everyone sees it that way. And if people were to do that in our country now, some would see them as traitors. Some would see them as patriots. Yet our founding fathers had to fight two wars on their own soil. Don't forget the War of 1812. The British came back. To put it another way, just say, and I know that this is not going to happen, let's just say the Taliban took control of America. Will they come with old deer rifles? Or are they coming with us, after us with AK-47s and other automatic weapons? Sounds silly, doesn't it? Do you really think countries as civilized as Poland, Germany, Russia, China, and similar Eastern European countries, thought their streets would run red with blood? They were civilized societies, too sophisticated for guns and too impressed with their own liberalism and sophistication. Isn't that what it means to be European? How did that end? Oh, that's right. There were these world wars where these vulgar little Americans marched across a continent spilling their blood for our freedoms, meaning the Europeans' freedoms. And now, we're those uncivilized, vulgar little Americans again as Europe is horrified at our gun laws. Yet, if there's another world war, who would come to Europe's rescue and fight knee-deep in it? Bloody? We would. These vulgar little Americans, not sophisticated enough to be considered equals of some Europeans. And I know not all pe Europeans feel that way. But I know there are those out there with their condescending, pedantic attitudes towards us who look down their nose at us vulgar little Americans and our guns and our primitive ways. Well, who was in those trenches with you? Who was digging people out of foxholes? Who was over there doing the dirty work during World War II? You're damn right it was us. And we saved your lives and your countries. And really the world. And you know why? Because we were armed. And we could, had the firepower to do it. And why couldn't you? Because you weren't armed. You were too sophisticated to fight back. And I know that there was resistance. I know there were people who fought. But before you condemn us, Europe, and elsewhere, remember the great sacrifices that we Americans have made in other countries and other continents 
wanting nothing more than you to enjoy the freedoms that we so cherish. And as I've said in many times in a frustrated manner, our people go to other countries to die to give them freedoms that they're not willing to fight for themselves. And that has been a case in some countries. Well, the Germans who lived in the Weimar Republic I believe if you told them that a few years later the Nazi party would strip their citizens of their basic freedoms, murder six million Jews, and be the cause of tens of millions of deaths in the Second World War? We don't know what tomorrow holds, folks. That's why we must be armed. Did the Russians who fought against the Tsar envision the murder of 20 to 50 million of its own people under Stalin? Yes, in case you didn't know, Stalin was the great mass murderer of the 20th century. It, well, he and Mao Zedong, uh, the Chinese premier, those two uh, murdered tens of millions. And it's not really a game, and there are different estimates between it. But each murdered well over 20 million of their own people through their policies and their their organizations and their hideous butchery. Okay? Now let's throw in some other butchery. The Poles, the Slavs, other, either, uh, other Eastern Europeans like me. Um, there two wars. You know how many of them were murdered and butchered? In large part because many of them didn't have guns and couldn't fight bar back. Here's a couple great things from uh, Premier Lenin. And I think he's very insightful on guns and liberty. He says only an armed people can be the real bulwark of popular liberty. Saying in, in, in not so many words, you can't have liberty without guns. Here's another one of his quotes. One of the basic conditions for the victory of socialism is the arming of the workers, or communists, and the disarming of the bourgeoisie, or middle class. One more from Lenin. A system of licensing and registration is a perfect device to deny gun ownership to the bourgeoisie or middle class. I bet you didn't know. But when you buy an army surplus gun, many of them, if they're being imported, you're not buying an operable gun. I'm going to switch topics here just a little bit. I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent on guns today. So, I've talked about the Second Amendment. I'm proud of my support of the Second Amendment. Now I'm going to distance myself about it, and I just want to go off on a little tangent here and talk about something else for a minute. When I first bought a foreign weapon, um, it was covered in a substance called cosmoline. That is how you usually buy a surplus military gun that's important. You are not buying an operable gun. It is covered in this greasy goo, it simply will not work. We may fire a round or two and jam. Why? For you folks who are new to guns who are now considering, maybe I need to have a gun, or I need to get one before the president limits your ability to do so. Think about this. I didn't know this until I you know, bought my first um, gun, a uh, military gun. I had a hunting rifle. Um, for you new guys, the guns. These guns are preserved in this greasy goo that we call cosmoline. These things are soaked in it. If you buy one, you're going to have to take it apart and degrease it. And I mean take your gun apart. And that is intimidating and sounds intimidating. If you're not willing to break apart a gun and break it, disassemble it completely, soak those parts in various substances to degrease them, and there's a bunch of them out there, and there's plenty of YouTube videos on it, take it apart. Uh, then you need to buy a new gun instead because these old guns like Mose and the Gunts, AK-47s, SKSs, whatever, if they're imported and they are old guns that are military surplus or you know exported to our country, these old guns are covered in cosmoline. And there are more guns than these that fit this category. But those are you know, the SKS and the Mose and the Gun are the two that come to mind the most. If you're buying one of these for self-defense, you need to know that if you buy it, you don't have a gun. You have to break it down, tear it apart, degrease it, clean the stock, get all the cosmoline off of that, let it soak out, do all kinds of crazy things to it, know, have enough knowledge to put it back together correctly, and then take it to a wrench to make sure you put it together right where so it actually works, and then after it fires without you know, malfunctioning, then you have a gun. So if you're looking to buy it, purchase a gun for self-defense, 
don't buy one of these if you're not willing to tear it apart and learn how to uh, do gun repair and, you know, strip it down to its bare minimum. This is a big deal. Okay? So this is something that no one bothered to tell me. I kind of willy-nilly just walked into uh, purchasing a surplus old gun, and I didn't know this. And I know that probably makes me sound really stupid, but I'm just being honest here, folks. I don't pretend to be some kind of god or something. I don't know everything. I bet you didn't know that if you plan on buying a semi-automatic rifle or handgun, but a rifle especially, you better consider buying it now. Why? Do you think in the next four years that gun buying is going to get any easier? It's not. And things you can buy now will most likely be outlawed or controlled tomorrow. If you plan on buying a gun in the next four years, you need to buy it now. Consider buying it now because the likelihood that things are going to get more difficult will be more taxed or whatever you want to say, controlled. It's going to be a lot harder to probably get a weapon and there's going to be many more restrictions. The next part is, though, only buy these guns if you are planning to use them wisely or not use them at all. If you're planning to do anything heinous or disgusting, do me a favor and get help. I'm only talking to people looking to protect their families and do what's right. And I hope I'm, everyone out there I'm talking to does what's right. I bet you didn't know. You can buy a new without Cosmoline, semi-automatic handgun in 9mm, 45, or 40 Smith & Wesson, any of those three, and there's more in, in this area, for under $200. Right now, they're made in America, and they're made by a company called High Point. If you can't afford a brand name gun, you can afford one of these. Well, what if they break? Well, they're tanks. They're very heavy, they're very strong, and they have a lifetime transferable warranty. Get it shipped back to the store, to the, uh, excuse me, the factory, and they'll fix it for you, no questions asked. They are that good. Their warranty, that is. You can debate whether or not you want a high point gun because it's not, you know, a Glock or something fancy. I'm telling you, if you can't afford a four, five or six hundred dollar Glock for 160, 170 dollars, you can get one. Don't even have to buy it locally. You can find someone who deals with these guns online. You can buy the gun online. And then that gun store will usually have you enter your zip code. And then usually if they use the same kind of online application programming process, um, FFL dealers, Federal Firearms Licensed Dealers, in your area will pop up. You pick one of them. And these are people that have agreed to take this firearms transfer. And they will... Uh, ship it to that FFL dealer, you go to that dealer, you pay 20 to 50 bucks for the transfer. In my case, the one that I used was $25, and uh, the gun is yours. All you need to do at the dealer that the gun was shipped to is file your application, pay the fee for the application, and in my case, wait three days. After everything's cleared and everything's fine, I walk out with my handgun, and there you go. And it's a very simple process. So if you're considering buying one, now's the time. Now that I've put a little distance between myself and my initial topic, I'm going to come back to it again. <coughs> Excuse me. I bet you didn't know. You're going to have to make some really tough decisions on everything we covered today. And yes, it sucks. It sucks because we are free people who have been given power and power, or freedom, is an awesome responsibility. You probably have to hate or hate having to deal with this issue as much as I do. But think how much more you would hate things if you didn't have the freedom to deal with the subject. You didn't have a choice. I bet you didn't know that I'm done with this. I'm done tweeting and talking about guns and politics. I'm burnt out and I'm spent. I need a break from the subject, and I'm going to move on to greener pastures. No, warm come, no warmth comes from a fire kindled with such sadness. I hope you understand, for now, I'm going to be moving on to some other things. <coughs> Excuse me. And hopefully, going back to the happy and positive and wonderful um, podcaster that you know and love.
It's too fast to handle with gravity. And this is an important topic that I'm not going to duck. And I know there are podcasters out there and people in the media who aren't afraid to handle this topic. I hope I handle it in a way that is respectful. And, uh, you know, you haven't lost respect for me, but to be very honest with you, it really doesn't matter if you do or you don't. This is how I feel. And I am going to staunchly defend the Second Amendment and at the same time feel horrible at times defending it because you know what democracy, freedom, the Second Amendment, sometimes this is an ugly business and it's not always easy. To all of you out there, as this will probably be my last podcast before Christmas, my warmest thoughts and my deepest sympathies. Please do not let the disgusting actions of a monster destroy your Christmas, or in other cases, holiday. I would ask, though, that you pray for the families of the victims and all who suffer with heavy hearts this Christmas, either from some kind of a tragedy or just from some other loss. Open your hearts, open your wallets and give, and open your voice to prayer. My final wish to you today in this world is peace. Peace be with you. This is Dan. Merry Christmas and happy holidays. And I'll be coming back to you soon with a much more happy and positive podcast. It's not to say I'm going to forget these horrible events. But I promise to bring you something uplifting and inspirational very soon. That's my show for today. Roughly December 21st, 2012. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. God bless. Are you sick and tired of having your First Amendment harassed or censored on Facebook? Use no more as we now have a new alternative to Facebook. It's called Awareness Act. Awareness Act is a social network designed for patriots, to be used by patriots, and is ran by patriots. Stand up and help in the fight to protect your constitutional rights. Patriots can create pages, blogs, videos, documents, articles, and so much more. We even have a unique news feed system that allows you to share, read, or connect with any patriot on Awareness Act. We are a dedicated tool for patriots to use against the tyranny our Constitution is facing. So if you're tired of having your rights infringed upon, come check us out at www.awarenessact.com. Again, that is www.awarenessact.com, the social network for patriots, not potatoes. Whether you take me for the fool, I know that I can be. Whether you The new Be Prepared for Christmas package from Sun Oven contains everything you need to harness the power of the sun for cooking, water, and dehydrating. The perfect gift for the preppers or outdoor enthusiasts on your shopping list. A Sun Oven uses the sun's power to bake, boil, or steam food, heat water for purification or personal hygiene, or solar dehydrate. When you use the sun's power on sunny days, you preserve your fuel storage for rainy days. Sun-baked foods retain moisture, have less shrinkage, and do not burn. Sun-baked roasts are tastier and more succulent, and sun-baked bread has unparalleled taste and texture. The new Be Prepared for Christmas package lets you roast an 18-pound turkey. For the past 26 years, Sun Ovens has been proudly made in the U.S., are durable, and have a long life and come with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Don't be fooled by cheap imitation. For a discount coupon, visit sunoven.com forward slash podcast. That's sunoven.com forward slash podcast. This is KPRN DB, broadcasting worldwide from Southeast Oklahoma, USA, to parts unknown.